Well, I've told the story about how I met George Romero about a hundred times at different personal appearances, conventions, and special event screenings and so on. Everybody always got a big kick out of it because it's a pretty zany story. And uh, so I thought, well, his funeral was in Toronto, a sad affair, of course. And I thought a lot of the attendees were from Toronto and probably hadn't heard the story. And even if they had, they'd probably get a kick out of it like you do out of, you know, out of any good joke. <laughs> because those were zany times. And uh, I was introduced to George by my friend Rudy Ritchie. And Rudy and I grew up in Clarendon, Pennsylvania, a rough mill town, but a pretty zany town in, in its own right. And uh, there were always lots of games. We played sandlot football and sandlot baseball and every other thing. One day I was riding my bike past Rudy's house I was in fourth grade and so was he, but I, I knew who he was, but we were in different classes. And I, as I'm going past his house on my bicycle, Rudy comes out onto the front porch and he says, you're Jack Russo. I said, you're Rudy Ritchie. <laughs> he said, we're having a football game out in my backyard after, after school tomorrow, you wanna play? I said, okay. Well, I was a little worried cause uh, I didn't know many of the kids in his class. And, and they, we went, even though we went to the same school, they came from a different part of town. And, uh, you know, I wanted to prove myself. I'm all, how am I going to get along with these strange kids? And, and the reason I'm telling this story, because crazy thing happened. I was, I was kind of small for my age, and these were a bunch of big kids, you know. And I'm thinking, holy hell, what am I going to do now? And uh, Rudy was playing quarterback, and I was on his team. And, and so he takes the ball and he throws a long ball, impossible to catch. It was going over everybody's head. And I got this big burst of adrenaline or something just out of my zeal to impress these strange kids. And I ran like hell and got behind it. They all quit because the ball was uncatchable. And I just kept running and somehow I got under that ball and I snared it in, in my fingertips and it was a touchdown. And they're all jumping up and down patting me on the back and everything. So that stayed in my mind all these years. So just because it was one of my rare moments of triumph, you know. So uh, as time went by, Rudy and I became even better friends because it turned out in our teenage years we discovered that we were both interested in writing and the arts and all that kind of stuff and not too many of the other kids were you know in fact you could get called a sissy if you displayed too big of an interest in things like that <laughs> Rudy and i would, would sleep on the floor at his house just to be together and talk about our writing and stuff we'd read each other's writing and get a kick out of that and compare notes and so on. And by the time we were 18 years old, uh, I was at West Virginia University and Rudy was had enrolled as a fine arts major at Carnegie Tech, which is now Carnegie Mellon. So he called me up on the phone and he said, when you come home for Christmas, you have to meet this great new guy that I met first day in, in college. And, we were both wearing our freshman beanies and lining up to get our to get our, our class assignments and so on, and uh, and it turned out we were in the same some of the same classes. And when we were uh, we were supposed to be drawing the nude model, George would be drawing scenes from Ben Hur in his note in his notepad. So I thought that was pretty cool. And I, you know, when I came home from for Christmas vacation, Rudy picked me up in his, he had a 1955 Plymouth convertible, and it wasn't a new car even then, it was a few years old, but he got it for a graduation from high school present. And we drove to George's apartment in the Oakland section of Pittsburgh, and Rudy honked the horn, and George came down to the street, and he was wearing a big sombrero, crisscrossed bandoleros of ammunition, two pistolas, and a big drooping black mustache. Well, we were so cool, you know, at 18 years old. We made no comment on that. George got in the car and we sped off to get some ice cream at the Dairy Queen. 
pull into the Dairy Queen, get out of the car, and the girl slammed the window down and wouldn't wait on us. So we, we just laughed. We thought this was a great lark. And Rudy said, you should have seen him la last week. He was covered head to toe in tinfoil. Well, well, there was some science fiction movie that he also liked. And George, George would dress up like characters in the different movies. And I, this was some kind of a... I forget what the movie was, but it was some kind of metallic visitor from out of out of space, outer space. So, anyway, the reason George was wearing all the all the uh, the sombrero and the bandoleros and all that was because another of his favorite movies was Viva Zapata, starring Anthony Quinn and Marlon Brando. And Emiliano Zapata was a was a colleague of Pancho Villa, and they were the two main revolutionaries in the 1920s in Mexico. And it's a fabulous movie. The screenplay is by John Steinbeck. I hadn't seen it right then. In fact, I didn't see it till a few years later. But uh, Anthony Quinn won an Academy Award for it, and it's just a wonderful movie. And anybody who hasn't seen it should should go and see it. So. It turned out George and Rudy and I were all interested in the arts and we wanted to write and I didn't I thought movies were made in Hollywood. I had no had messed around a little bit with eight millimeter movies, but uh, George was a total nut about movies and he he had worked as a gopher or something on a couple movies in, in New York, which is where he was from. And his father was uh Worked was an artist and worked for a commercial art company that mostly did uh, movie art standees and banners and posters and all that. So George was just surrounded by that stuff and it, you know, it lit a big fire. He won some kind of prize when he was 15 years old for a, for a movie called uh, Man from the Meteor. And I'd never saw it, but I knew because George told us about it right away that he had almost got arrested and thrown in jail for, for setting a dummy on fire and dropping it, dropping it off the roof of his apartment building. So anyway, I always gravitated toward the, you know, zany, fun kind of people. So right away, Rudy and, and George and I became friends from 18 years old on. Uh, later, of course, uh, we, we did Night of the Living Dead, in uh, which I came up with the idea of doing the movie after we had worked for a number of years on commercial projects, and and we had a by that time we had a wall covered with awards for our work, and we were very zealous about our work, very proud of it, and uh, but we wanted to be feature filmmakers. You know, Night of the Living Dead was our first venture into that area. Well, I met Ross Steiner the same week that I met George. Again, we were 18 years old. And Russ was in a play at the Pittsburgh Playhouse. And the Pittsburgh Playhouse was a, a pretty respectable place. I mean, a lot of people that turned out to be famous came, learned there, learned acting there. And like uh, Frank Gorshin, uh, Shirley Jones, Jack Klugman, and I can't remember many more of them, but a lot of famous people came for there. I think Gene Kelly. So this, I didn't know life. Russ, but I was going to meet him. He was on stage in, the, in this play, and I don't remember the name of the play either, but Russ had one line in it. He was a soldier, and the general or somebody was inspecting the troops and asking about this girl that they all knew. And, and Russ's line was, well, she's a whore, sir. <laughs> and then that stuck in my mind all these years. But the other thing was, George came into the play after we were all seated. And the play was going to open. The curtain was going to go up. And, uh, and George was, wearing, uh, George was uh, wearing a cape, a big cape. And he was carrying a very ornate Victorian cane. And the reason he was dressed up like that was that he was also in a play at the YMCA at that time, and and he and it was a Victorian melodrama, and he was playing the killer. <laughs> so, I mean, we just got you know our kicks out of this stuff, and uh, so a lot of this was going through my mind at the funeral in Toronto, 
and and I mean it was a, a beautiful uh, uh, funeral home and there was a huge spread of food and the food was all the kind of stuff George liked and I liked and you know we went there uh, it was like provolone cheeses and you know meats and prosciutto and pepperonis and really good numerous kinds of bread and all that kind of stuff hot pepper sweet peppers and all that and then of course the coffin was there and and uh, I went there with Russ and his wife Ramona and uh, my friend Rob Lucas and uh, Rob happened to be my co-director on on my new movie My Uncle John is a Zombie but we're very close friends and Gary Steiner was there Russ's brother who had worked with us all those early years including Night of the Living Dead and there were about 25 people who we spoke at the, at, uh, at the funeral. Well, first of all, when I got there, I'm, I walked, you know, I walked around looking at things, and there were lots of big, blown-up photos of George and the, just on easels. And I, I didn't think I was going to cry, because <laughs> by that time we knew that he had cancer from March. So um, when George was living in Pittsburgh, um, he and his, and his wife uh, Christine and his son Andrew and daughter Tina. Well, Tina and my daughter Julia were the same age and we would go out to dinner with George and Chris a lot of times and they had a live-in nanny there so the nanny would watch the kids and we'd go out and have fun and that you know, we worked together on different things over the years, and then George moved to Toronto when he when he married uh, Suzanne, and I didn't see him as often then. Uh, but I was walking or just walking around looking at some of these photos, and then there was a there was a about a three by four foot photo of George at the rewinds, the editing rewinds, and it was shot. From the, from behind him, so that you saw George doing this with the rewinds, but from the back. Well, that just brought so many memories back because we didn't even have a movie Ola in those days. I mean, Night of the Living Dead and every commercial film, every film we made, was made with a sound reader, a, a, a movie scope with a screen about that big. In, in a uh, in a synchronizer, and you had to crank crank both the feed reel and the take up reel. You had to crank them like this, and George had this uncanny ability to crank them both in sync. Even though one the feed reel might be this thick and the take up reel might be that thick, and to make those, to crank those at 24 frames a second so that you can actually see the picture on that little movie scope and hear the sound pretty much the way it should be. Anyway, George could do that. I couldn't. I mean, <laughs> when I did it, it was like spit, sputter and stop, you know. Well, I saw that and I just burst into tears. When George would, would see me at conventions or elsewhere through the years, especially after he moved away, he'd say, Jack, 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 tell me something funny. Tell me, make me laugh. Tell me something funny. So at this Mad Monster convention in, in Charlotte, um, there, was a, there were a bunch of us, Night of the Living Dead people, as featured guests, and I was right next to Richard Ritchie, and that's Rudy's cousin. R Richard was the zombie in Night of the Living Dead that he's the first one that gets shot in the head. He gets shot in the chest. He's trying to grab the gun. The window's shattered. He's trying to grab the, the gun from, from the Ben character played by Dwayne Jones. And he get, and Dwayne shoots him in the chest and he goes down but he gets back up. And then he's shot again and he goes down and he gets back up. And then Dwayne shoots him in the head and that's when he stays down and that's that's where we show people that a ghoul had to be shot in the head. The brain had to be destroyed, and that's how you had to kill him. Well, 
in the remake in 1990, I was coming up with different ideas just to dress up the ending of the film, the climax, and I said to George, you know, in Night of the Living Dead, Marilyn Eastman, in a diff made up as a ghoul, she played two parts in that. She played Helen, but she also played a ghoul, and she ate an insect from a tree. And I said, so why don't we have one eat a mouse? He said, go talk to the special effects guy. So I went, and they said, yeah, we can make a mouse. <laughs> so Richard and I were talking about that. <laughs> and he said, he said, you know, it was a really funny feeling having that furry thing in my mouth. I said, you ought to be glad we didn't shove a gerbil up your butt. <laughs> and everybody cracked up and they were all, so I said, I'm going to go out in the hall and see George's table. He had about six tables full of his merchandise out there. And usually he would have a line around the block, you know. So I said, I'm going to go see if George has a big line or not, and I'm going to tell him this. So he didn't have a big line. I sat with him behind his table, and I told him, and he did crack up. He, did, he got a big laugh out of it, because Richard can be kind of spacey, and we all know that, you know. And so we're getting a laugh at Richard's expense, sort of. And after he got done laughing, he told me, he said, they found things on, in my lungs, and I have to have a a biopsy and CAT scan and so on. So that was March of 2017. So we knew from then that it wasn't going to be good. And we were hoping, you know, like you always hope. And he passed away in, uh, in, in June. So uh, I, I told the story to the people. They actually gave me a standing ovation. They got a big kick out of the the way we met and, and so on. And that's what got the ovation. <laughs> so, so, uh, and I, I said, you know, George and I would take long walks on the wharf in Pittsburgh and, or when we were together in New York or wherever, we'd walk and talk about all kinds of things, movies and music and so on. And we were, we were talking about how much we liked the music and the style, the flair and the, of, of uh, Dean Martin and Sammy Davis and Frank Sinatra. And, and I said, you know, the world's a poor place without them. And then, you know, George Romero made his mark on the world too. And the world is a poor place without George Romero, and now we'll cherish our memories.